Thanks, Danielle, and thank you uh, to the IRIS audience for joining me for a while today. I'm really excited to be able to show you some of the, um, the kinds of analyses we can do in MATLAB that you might find useful. Um, a few months ago, Danielle um, sent it, or some others from IRIS sent a, a questionnaire out asking what you'd want to know uh, about MATLAB from us, and so we used that um, in part to help inform uh, what the talk is today. In addition, uh, I, along with some colleagues, were at our booth in, uh, at AGU this past year, and we um, talked to a bunch of people there, and so we ended up with um, a, uh, an agenda that looks like this. I'm going to first talk about how you might be able to build up an interactive map including geospatial events. I'm going to then talk about um, something that I think is near and dear to most geoscientists, handling really big geospatial data sets or big data sets in general um, because Lord knows we have lots and lots of data there. And finally, it was clear to me um, that not everyone necessarily knew uh, all the nooks and crannies of MATLAB, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what's new in the uh, recent releases. And some of that I will do as I'm doing my demos, and some of that I will do afterwards uh, summarizing. And then I want to finish up um, to make you aware about all the community resources there are available. So, whoops, sorry. Uh, so I'm going to go now to um, the first demonstration in which I want to um, do some research about earthquakes from around the world. And so I have found a website, it's from the USGS, where I can load uh, earthquakes uh, for the past 30 days, uh, magnitude 4.5 or above, and I'd like to plot that uh, and overlay it with the plate tectonic uh, boundaries. And so um, it would be really nice if when I was done with that, I could end up with some kind of report, maybe something I do month by month and, and hand in as part of a um, proposal where I'm trying to get some research funds or something like that. And I might end up with something like this. What you see here is an HTML document that has uh, a table of contents with some sections here. And it's saying, oh, first I read in the data and I extract some information about the earthquakes and um, I'm going to do some uh, calculations. First, I'll find out in the table what size the first few earthquakes were. And uh, then I'm going to sort the table, find out where the largest one is. In this when I ran this, uh, this particular um, uh, report, it happened to be one at the uh, uh, northern mid-Atlantic ridge. And uh, I want to do some things like place all these earthquakes on um, a map that I can choose to uh, have as a uh, background, either um, the uh, uh, bathymetry or a bunch of different choices that I can use for the base map. Um, and then I might want to see, well, how many of these are following, falling near plate boundaries so I can load in some data from the plate boundaries and overlay these on my map. So it'd be really nice if I could automate some of that. And so that's what I'm going to um, try to show you how to do the analysis and how you might automate it so you could make a report. So I'm going to come over to MATLAB and uh, I'm using R2014B, which is the latest release right now. And um, for the benefit of those of you who um, may not be using a current version of MATLAB, I just want to point out that basically now there is this uh, area up at the top that's called the tool strip and it has all the, uh, all the goodies that used to be in the menus and more. Um, we'd like to make it so that you find all of the good things that we have in MATLAB um, just by, by poking around up here rather than being buried somewhere deep inside and you didn't even know we had something. So I'm using this uh, MATLAB code, at separating it into sections with the percents. And I'm going to just come here. I, I use this style of demoing so often where I have a script and I'm going to run a section in advance, and so I've just put this on my quick access toolbar. And for right now, I'm going to shrink that tool strip so that it doesn't take quite so much space. So I'm going to um, read in these earthquake locations uh, from the USGS server that you can see here. And it's taking just a little bit of time. And now what I'd like to do is I'd like to get information about each earthquake and their location and put them into some structures here. And I'm going to take the uh, earthquake data information and put it into a table. And I'm going to show you the first piece of that table. 
So I'm going to show you rows one through five and all the columns. And if we take a look here at Quake Table, I can open it in the variable editor. What you see is something that kind of looks like um, a matrix, but it has labels across the top and not just numbers. And you'll notice also that the um, columns, uh, some of them appear to be strings. Here's, for example, if I show you place, it is a string with the place and it's giving you some identifying information. Um, the first column happens to be magnitude, so it's actually a numeric value. And so I'm allowed in these tables to put together information that belongs together, like each row is basically a record, a magnitude, a place, time, uh, time zone, and so on. And you can see by the scroll bar at the bottom here that we have quite a few variables. And it has in there um, all kinds of information that we might care about, what kind of um, magnitude was computed, and so on. So what I'd like to do is now see what variables there really are. So I'm going to look at the properties of this quake table. And you can see I have those labeled columns, uh, 26 of them. And what I'd like to do is I'd actually like to get the location information, in other words, the hypocenter information, and put that into this table as well. So I can get um, the uh, coordinates from the original location uh, structure that I had and place in um, a column named lawn, a column named lat, and a column named depth, um, the three coordinates for the hypocenter. And now when I do that and we look at the column names, you see that I now have 29 instead of 20, uh, 26 because I've added lawn, lat, and depth. So what does this quake table look like? Um, let's take a, um, or the magnitudes. If we just look through the first five magnitudes, there's nothing to say what order they're in. In fact, you can see they're not ordered. Now you may be saying or thinking, uh, I use MATLAB with structures. These different names are kind of like having structures. Why not just use structures? Well, if I tried to do some manipulation with a structure, I'd have to first do it in um, the, the first field and then the second field and all the way through the 29th field. When I'm using the table, what you can see is I can take it and sort row at a time, a record at a time, and I can sort it by um, the magnitude of the quake ascending. And then when I do that, we can look at the five final quakes that we have here. And you can see the end one has a magnitude 7.1. And we can just index into the table and find the place lat long depth here. And we see again, it's um, similar to, it's the one that actually is in the report I just showed you because I ran that this morning. And so we have something here uh, south of Iceland, but on the uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Now, um, what I might like to do is put markers on a map. I'm sort of thinking ahead to having a map and I wanna put markers for where the earthquakes are. And I'd like to have those markers somehow um, in a color so that I can tell by the color which ones are the most intense earthquakes. So I'm going to um, find the range of the magnitudes that we have this month and I'm going to um, colorize them basically by the color map and I want to just show you because this is something that is new in R2014B, we have a new default color map and it's called Perula or Parula. There seem to be a lot of different pronunciations but you can see that it goes from blue up to yellow and one of the nice things about this color map is that it is um, uh, designed in such a way so that in addition if you need to print this for some reason in grayscale you get the same feeling for dark to light in it as you do from blue to yellow so the the uh, intensity is about the same and there's no parts that are preferentially highlighted so it's not going to accidentally um, uh, highlight everything that's in the middle of your your um, your color spectrum there okay so I'm going to basically colorize the values of our different earthquake magnitudes and I'm going to take the title from the quake table and make that into a name so that when I hover over um, one of my uh, earthquakes, I'll know which earthquake it is. And I'm going to actually put some information about each quake into um, a data type that's in the mapping toolbox called a geopoint. And geopoints basically are a way of, they, they have some information knowing about uh, geolocations. So, um, it makes them, them very amenable to working in a, a lot of different um, mapping contexts. So what I want to do now is I want to create an interactive web map. I'm going to use the ocean base map and I'm going to put the um, uh, earthquakes that we just found on 
again, colorized by magnitude, and it takes a little bit of while. This is something that you need an internet connection for, which is good that I have one here, uh, because it's pulling some of the ocean, the, the, like the bathymetry data and stuff from the web. And then I'm overlaying my points. And here they are. I hope you can see them now. And now I can come over to any one of these. And if I click on one of these earthquake locations, what you see here is the title. That's a 5.1 from the South Atlantic Ocean and all kinds of other information that might be valuable to you. So I showed you the color map Perula, which was yellow at the top. This seems to be our largest one. And you can see a bunch of information about that as well. And um, so I told you this is an interactive map. There's more things I can do with this. Um, there's a panel to the side here. And if I click that, I can select any other base map I want, and it will load that from the web. Or um, uh, right now, it being February in the US, uh, we are sort of um, uh, focused on weather. So I can overlay lay, um, a layer of the storms in the US as of today. And so there's a bunch of different layers. And you can also prepare data yourself to put in these layers. And in fact, there's something else I'd like to do with this now. I'd kind of like to see what's the distribution of these earthquakes with respect to the plate boundaries, because we know many earthquakes happen on plate boundaries, and not all of them. But we'd like to see a little bit more. So let me come over here. And I'm going to come to my current folder, and I'm going to show you this um, uh, file that we got from the web, and we have all the uh, uh, attributions in the uh, code here so that you'll be able to look at it. And if I open it, what you see is I have something that has a little label and a bunch of lo latitude, longitude points. And I'm going to try not to do too much of this. Oop, I just saw what I wanted right there. Um, we have another la label coming up somewhere here. Here's another label, and then some latitude, longitude points. And we'd like to be able to import this into MATLAB pretty easily. Well, um, there are a bunch of different ways that we can do it, but one of my favorite ways is to come up to the Home tab and use this tool that's on the, um, the, the tool strip here called Import Data. And what this does, it's going to have me select a file here. And it's going to be as intelligent as it can to figure out what kind of data it thinks is in there, whether they're um, a comma separated list, uh, whether what's delimiting things. And so what you see here is it says these numbers, it seems to be two columns, mostly numbers, although it acknowledges that there's not always numbers. You can see this first line is grayed out. And what I can do here is if I want to bring these in as um, latitude and longitude, I can simply come in here and uh, rename them. And um, I can leave them in as column vectors. And what I can do is I can say, oh, if you come across something that you can't interpret as a number, please replace it with a NAN, which is not a number. And that way, I'll be able to work with this as um, a numeric array when we get done. But suppose I'm coming along here, and I'm looking, and I, I happen to focus on this particular um, latitude, longitude for part of the coastline, or if I end up selecting a little bit and looking at it. And then you'd like to get back the original selection that came in. The nice thing is, is that MATLAB keeps a history of your selections. So I can come back here and get my original selection, even though I played around. Now, um, coastlines on geologic terms are changing over time. But on our time frame, they're not really changing very much. And so this is basically a constant. So I can imagine reading this in um, once and not needing to reuse this, but needing to reuse reading it in for more and more plots, but not needing to do it necessarily for more different kinds of data. On the other hand, there may be someone who has a set of uh, um, plate boundaries that are digitized at a much different um, uh, granularity. And so if, if it's set up the same way, but with different numbers of rows per uh, plate boundary, what I'm going to do should still work here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come along here. And I could just import the data. But what I can do instead is generate a function so I can do this again in the future. And I'm going to generate a function. And what you see here is a file um, called import file by default. And I'm just going to save this. And we'll call it import file. And I can just now say, I want to bring in latitude and longitude. 
And in fact, if I can't remember what's going on here, um, there's a bunch of things I can do. I can uh, I can go import file, and uh, it's going to tell me it needs a file name and so on. But I also use as an example the code that we put in um, the uh, the code that we were going to use the data we were going to use from the file we used it from. So I'm going to replace what I was typing here with this one, and I'm going to I don't really need to know what row etc. it started on, and I'm going to load in the data. And now I have my data. And um, one of the things that, um, so I loaded that in uh, with a different uh, file myself earlier uh, today, or I created a different file earlier today from the same uh, data where I called it import plates. There's more things I want to do because I want to sanity check this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to also load um, coastline information that I have, create a figure, and create a world map with the mapping toolbox so that we can see um, whether these plate boundaries make sense, uh, whether I've imported the data correctly, in other words. And it does look like we have something that's sensible. What you see here is you see the coastlines here. So here's Africa, and here is the African plate. If I want to emphasize the African plate, what I can do is I can find it. It happens to be the first one. And what I do is, remember I said that those um, uh, letters that we couldn't read in as numbers, they were going to get converted into NADA numbers, NANs. I'm going to find that first NAN value, and I'm just going to plot the data going up to that first uh, non-numeric non, uh, value, and I'm going to overplot on this plot um, that particular uh, uh, bit of um, plate boundary, and here we see in red the African uh, plate now. Okay. So now I'm going to take those latitudes and longitudes for the plate um, uh, plate boundaries and convert them into the geo points again, so that I can use them very easily in in any kinds of maps uh, from mapping toolbox, either the regular kind like you just saw the world map, or now what I can do is I can append that to um, the uh, world map we have here, and so what you see now that we've added is the plate boundaries. In fact, I labeled them so I have got just a name, plate boundaries here. And uh, another thing that you can see here is that um, uh, I centered this map on the longitude of the largest quake. So here's the largest quake and it is in the center so that we could see what was going on. Um, so that's a brief tour of being able to create an interactive map. And now, if I'm satisfied that this is all working the way I want, and I want to do this month by month by month, I can take this same code, and I can say, I want to publish it. And by uh, default, it's going to publish to HTML. But if you want to have your report in a different form, you've got several more choices as well. I'm not going to spend the time doing that right now. Um, but you get the idea uh, about that, I hope. And I'm just going to close a few of these windows now. So um, I've just showed you uh, loading earthquake data from the web from the USGS site, and it was the data that went through today. So we found an earthquake that was uh, the largest one was on the um, mid-Atlantic ridge towards the north. Last week there happened to be one in uh, uh, the South Pacific instead was the largest one. So we were able to sort and visualize the um, quakes by magnitude. I was able to load plate boundaries and make that reproducible to load them again and again, maybe month by month, and superpose the earthquake and plate boundaries on the interactive map. And I used MATLAB and the mapping toolbox for that. There are some things that you might find interesting in addition to the tool two products that I just showed you. Um, mapping has a lot more. Uh, definitely, it has map projections and, and um, line of sight calculations and all kinds of things. Uh, I find that for many of the people working in um, uh, geosciences, uh, image processing and sometimes even image acquisition might be uh, relevant. We've got a lot of different um, capabilities in the statistics toolbox. One of the big ones we're spending time on now is machine learning, we have many more, and many uh, state-of-the-art optimization algorithms. Um, and basically, uh, we, we have a lot of different tools in all these different domains, good for mathematical modeling, um, signal processing, and so on. Um, 
One thing that I think is near and dear to everyone's heart is getting their data into MATLAB. If you can't get your data in, um, kind of doesn't matter how good uh, something else is because you can't work on your data. And MATLAB has been very, very uh, good over the years at extending the different kinds of formats we work with. And here you see there's a bunch of different formats that MATLAB understands um, between the uh, um, base MATLAB image processing toolbox and um, mapping toolbox. And then there, of course, there are data sources available on the web. Um, uh, there's data from NOAA. Um, a brief one that I'll talk about in a little while, just shortly, is Iris Fetch, which is hosted on the Iris website. And it's meant to be able to get at the data that, that is hosted uh, by Iris and being able to fetch um, the pieces that are relevant for what you're doing. And of course, there's EarthCube and uh, uh, all these other um, different sites. So a lot of different places where you can get data and read them into MATLAB. I now want to move on to handling big geospatial data. Um, I, I remember when I was working on my thesis and I was trying to do something with an, about a thousand by a thousand matrix, and of course that was absolutely enormous at the time. Um, that's not the size problem we're calling big these days, but people still have really big problems. Uh, uh, or problems that have really big amounts of data. So I want to talk about what you might do to handle that in MATLAB so that you don't just have to sort of throw up your hands and say, well, I can't really work with this. Um, so what I'm going to do in this demonstration is analyze some historical seismic data that we have. And um, one of the problems is it's, so, it's a slightly messy um, comma separated value file. There's some issues with the data quality, and I don't mean the data that was entered itself into the file. People type that in correctly, but because it's historical, some of the older stuff, um, they didn't have refined equipment like we have today. So there's issues with respect to the actual quality of the data that's recorded in there. And we could be in a situation where, especially with historical data, there could be so, uh, so much data that we exceed the amount of memory uh, we can realistically use on our computer. And what I would like to do is take some of this uh, data um, and try to verify uh, a piece of information about that data against a published model. And I'm going to compare an area near Japan, um, near the Tohoku uh, 2011 earthquake. And so I'm going to verify the data that we have here and what it looks like compared to the published model, like I said. So I'm going to come over to MATLAB here now. And uh, I'm going to close out my other files. And I'm going to change my directory. And I just happen to have a shortcut on my toolbar here. If I edit my shortcut, Shortcuts are a great way to set yourself up for things. I just clear everything, close everything, clear my command window. And so I'm going to just hit my button, and that just makes everything um, start from scratch again, basically. So I'm going to work on this big data set. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up this um, CSV file that we downloaded from the web. And again, we've got um, the attribution um, in uh, uh, some information that we will send you. And so what I'm going to do is instead of just loading it in, I'm going to create um, basically something that we call a data store. I want to be able to refer to this file and this data, but not necessarily load all of it in at once, because I may not even be able to. And so what I want to do is just basically create a data store for this. Happen to know that there's a huge number of header lines, 56, and I want to preview it. And if I preview it, um, I get a warning here because some of the variable names wouldn't be okay with MATLAB, but what you see here is we have dates starting at uh, uh, July 1900, uh, latitude, longitude. They don't have semi-major and minor axes and strikes with them. You see Q for quality. That's the quality of the depth determination, and there's an uncertainty. And then we have uh, a magnitude and a quality associated with that and an uncertainty, and some more. We keep going on and on and on and on and on. Well. We don't actually need to load all of that data for the particular analysis I'm going to do next. So what I'm going to do now is instead of loading everything in or instead of referring to everything, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select a subset. I'm going to choose the date, the latitude, longitude, and depth because we want the hypocenter information. I'm going to get the quality of that um, depth information. I'm going to get the um, magnitude information and the quality of the magnitude. I'm going to get the moment and the moment author. Um, for the first variable, uh, the selected format that I want to use is I'm, I'm going to get tell it that it's years, um, months, days, hours, minutes, seconds, um, and fractional seconds. And I want to put this into what's called a date time format, which is new in MATLAB. Uh, 
in our 2014 B. The next thing I want to do for numbers five and seven, which are the two quality measures, is I want to turn them in, into what's called a categorical variable. Basically, the, if you look through the code, and I'll look through it in just a, or some of the data in just a minute, um, the, the quality are basically rated A, B, and C, where A is the best and C is the worst. And so those only can take on three values, A, B, or C. So I kind of don't need all kinds of information. I kind of just need three pieces of information. Is it A or B or C? And so I'm able to reduce some uh, memory usage by, by restricting them to those values. And then finally, I want to make a string out of the author information here. So I'm going to set that. And now let's preview our data store now that we've reduced the number of columns we're looking at. And what you see here is now I have some dates. And um, uh, there's no moments for the first few that are um, being read in. So that's just a preview. Now, Another um, possibility that I can change in my data store is how many rows I'm going to read in each chunk. Because what I'm going to do is instead of trying to read the whole thing in, not only am I going to chunk the information, but I'm going to do something uh, a little bit trickier too. And I'm going to show you that in just a minute. Not trickier, more interesting. Um, okay, so let me um, come back here, sorry, and let's take a look at a data chunk. So let's open this. And we have our columns here. Um, this is a table again. Uh, we have the date. And this is now a date time um, that we can look at. And we have um, latitude, longitude, depth. And when you look at the quality measure here, and I've only loaded in part of the data because I'm previewing it, what you can see in this column is I have an A now. And you have see I have some Bs and Cs. Uh, not just only C's for the quality measures. So I am now going to um, reset my um, data store because I read through part of a chunk and so it's sort of thinking about being on the next chunk. I'm going to reset it and I'm going to read into a table for my earthquakes only those, um, only those records in there that have the first quality measure, the quality of the depth, in other words, equal to A. So I want the depth to be really well known for this. Okay? And then each time I read in a chunk, I'm going to take all the ones that, through the logical indexing there, meet that criteria. I'm going to take those versions and add them onto my earthquake of quality uh, array. And so let me run that. And you can see I read in um, 20, went through the while loop 23 times. In fact, I could have, in this case, fit that all into memory at once. But there's a possibility that I might not have. Maybe it threw out so much data that that wasn't a problem. Or um, uh, if I'd kept more data, maybe I wouldn't have been able to. So um, I read it uh, like that right now, just to show you how you would do it if you had a really large array. OK, and then I want a sanity check. And I almost always sanity check by making a plot. And here's a plot, and you can sort of see there's the African plate and some of the Aust Australia plate over here. So you can see this looks sort of like, I think we got the data incorrectly now. So that's good. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to start thinking about what these dates are. So I would like to make a histogram of er earthquakes versus time. And so let's first find out what the time span is. So these dates that I was talking about, what you can see here is I can do math on these dates even though they print out as strings. So they're, these, they're their own new type. And the nice thing about them is they're meant to be human readable. And you can change the format to whatever format you want. But they also have these math properties, so I can do arithmetic on them. So it, they, they're sort of the best of both worlds there. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to create uh, the um, uh, histogram. I want to find out how many there earthquakes there are by year. Um, of high quality. So let me come along here and do that. And what you see here, of course, is that um, the number of earthquakes from the beginning of the 20th century till now are growing and growing and growing with time. And we should be really concerned. Well, not really. OK, I'm joking there. Of course, what we're seeing here is the change in the world with respect to instrumentation. And the fact that back in the early 1900s, we didn't have very many seismometers, and we weren't getting very high quality uh, data from all of them. We were certainly getting it from some of them. And power supplies, they didn't have uninterruptible power supplies then, and so on. And so I think basically what you're seeing is the explosion of more and more really good high quality instruments and um, codes for actually doing the earthquake locations now. 
So it's interesting that we're seeing more and more uh, with time. It doesn't mean they're all large magnitude, of course. Um, and now what I'd like to do is uh, do some statistics. How many, how close are these earthquakes together, these high quality ones that we can identify? So we can calculate the, uh, the median and the maximum and minimum difference between the dates. So I'm going to take the difference between successive dates and calculate some statistics. And uh, the median time between earthquakes is about a day. This is the, uh, in hours and this is, whoops, this is, this is in hours and this is in days. That's what I did in the code. And so it's just kind of interesting to see, of course, the longest one was because back in the olden days, we had, good ones were few and far between in terms of the quality of the data that we had. OK, so now what I'd like to do is let's um, plot the um, magnitude versus time and see how that's changing. And here's my magnitude versus time. And uh, you know, do things look appreciably different as a function of time? Well, I don't know. One thing that's interesting is we can we seem to be able to resolve smaller quakes than we used to be able to resolve. What I'd like to do now is come in here and just to see if there's anything particularly interesting going on. So let me zoom in on a, a couple years here. And when I do, you see that the dates, which were um, decades before, are now months and and year have months and year labels. And so. Um, the fact that you lab that we labeled this with a date time means that we can see more information and zoom in without trying to figure out now what date was did that mean? Uh, we're able to finally um, really see what what's going on with the with the plot. Okay, so now um, so you might ask, okay, so we looked at earthquakes as a function of year. How about as a function of season? So let me make a histogram of earthquakes by month. And here you see a, a histogram now. And uh, I'm not going to do the statistics. This is February, so it's not surprising that there's fewer per month. But it kind of looks like um, it could be from a uh, uniform distribution. I don't know. I, you could do all of the statistics you want there to figure that out. I just wanted to show you how easy it was to manipulate the information, though. OK, so now um, the next thing I want to do, and I mentioned this earlier, is I want to um, zoom in on a particular area in Japan near Tohoku. And um, what inspired this was um, coming over here. Uh, there was a poster um, and uh, for the earthquake. And so what we see here is the map of Japan and a bunch of the different um, epicenters for earthquakes. And um, someone did a lot of work annotating it and trying to figure out what was going on. What we'd like to do is sort of see if we can figure out what's going on from the data that we have um, with respect to not to Hoku per se, but per se with respect to all the earthquakes that have happened in this region in the past. And this paper, which I'll get back to, has a particular plot that I'd look to, like to compare to. So I'm going to now take my latitude and longitude and set them to a small area um, near Tohoku, set my latitude and longitude bounds, and I'm just going to extract earthquakes. My EQJ are the earthquakes of quality from Japan. Um, so I'm ba basically saying any latitudes that are bigger than the first latitude and less than the second latitude, similarly with longitude. And I'm going to make my depths be negative um, because, um, because that's a good convention to use for what I want to do next. OK, so I'm going to get those earthquakes. Let's find the largest one. And we can just use the max function on that and find out which index it is. And in fact, you can see here that in fact, when I index in with the largest one, it is March 11th, 2011, the Tohoku quake with uh, a magnitude 9.09. .09. And so um, MATLAB has been able to automate that. What I'd like to do next is um, uh, make a plot of that area and take a look around with the different earthquakes we have. So I'm going to load a um, uh, Topo map that we, topo -like information we got from the NASA Worldwind uh, WMS server here. And here is my map and the earthquakes on it. And I believe that we would find out that this was the Tohoku one. What you see here also is I changed the uh, color map here. Um, I changed the color map to a map here that basically has blues in the ocean and then uh, the, the uh, a reasonable color scheme for the land. Okay, so um, 
and the marker sizes were chosen to be marker sizes based on the magnitude of the earthquake. So that's what's going on with this. We're basically saying use the point size to represent the magnitude. So that's why I said I think this one is Tohoku because uh, that's the biggest one I see there. Okay. Um, the next thing I want to do is I want to actually convert these um, latitude longitude data these to um, local Cartesian coordinates um, because that's often a way that in a small area you want to look at data. And so I'm going to turn them into east, north, and up or x, y, and z. Compare them to the reference ellipsoid, base them on the reference ellipsoid, convert our units here, and now I want to make a... a a 3D scatter plot to see where the quakes are. And I'm looking at the north and east plane. So I'm kind of looking down in a similar way that I had in this, although these are in a different coordinate system, remember, they're not they're not in a mapping coordinate system now. They're in the local Cartesian one. If I come along here now and I um oh I something is funny. Um and I change that um, view. I want to say the view is. I have. Uh, let me change the view. I don't remember what it was now. Um, I could have this totally wrong. That is not what I wanted. Um, well, let me go back. Um, view 090. Come back here. And now what I want to do is I'm going to rotate this a little bit. I basically want to rotate it so that I'm um, looking at um, kind of depth versus east, but not quite east. I want to turn it a little bit, something like this. And what I want to do now is um, make a new figure and compare this to the figure that I pulled out of the um, documentation that we had before and I'll show that to you again in just a minute but if I can come along here and play with this what you begin to see is we've got the earthquakes that cluster along the crust here and we've got the earthquakes that cluster along the upper side of the subduction zone going down here so we are basically able to re reproduce at some level the diagram that's in here in this um, paper with the um, data that we have from that historical data set um, and in fact if I come here Here's the paper, we come down, and this is the plot that I was just showing you. Okay, and um, once again, if I would like to, I could come along here and say, oh, I really want to tell this story, let me publish the results. I'm not going to spend time doing that right now either, because I want to make sure I have time to talk to you about a little bit more. Um, so what I just used is MATLAB in the mapping toolbox, loaded a subset of data from a large comma separated value file and we plotted data by the epicenter location um, we looked at the histograms per year and month and then the hypocenters near Japan and we were able to validate the um, the findings from the historical record and have them sort of give us the same information that we had um, in the uh, published model so basically we were able to pretty much reproduce the results there um, I now would like to talk just a little bit more about big data capabilities in MATLAB. Um, we had many capabilities already. We were working, uh, MATLAB was working on 64-bit processors and we have streaming constructs and block processing. In our 2014B, we added three major new pieces. Data stores, which you just saw where I was allowed to preferentially bring in just the records I cared about. MapReduce, which is a framework for letting me um, sort of collect the information in a way so that I can process it after I collect it in these chunks. And then if you have access to a uh, Hadoop distributed file system, you can work in that um, arena uh, with R2014B. So if you have a large amount of data and they're in the Hadoop framework, you can work there as well. Now, um, one of the other capabilities that you see on here is parallel computing, and I wanted to talk a minute about that. Um, so if you have a code where you're doing a, a for loop, and maybe you're doing something, for example, like uh, running a simulation and having a bunch of different starting values, and you don't know which one is the best starting value, so you're just trying a lot of them. Um, I can. This is basically the code that I would use. I initialize some stuff. I have a for loop that I run, and then I post process. If I want to run that same code in parallel, it is usually really, really easy. What I do is I initialize my variables. I get access to what's called a parallel pool, which is basically some sort of um, 
uh, system, and it might be your local system, like on my laptop with two cores, I can run a parallel pool. It might be a cluster, it might be the cloud, it, any collection of other uh, hardware where you can run MATLAB. Basically, you run, um, create a parallel pool, you simply substitute four for par four, so a parallel for loop, and then you post process, and then just to be uh, a good citizen, you delete the pool when you're done so you're not ha hanging on to these external resources that other people might need. But your code, your main code, look at that, your algorithm, your post process, and your initialize, no change. So it's pretty easy to make that migration. It's similarly, um, uh, I was going to go on to something, but uh, what I wanted to say is many of you may not know um, uh, about access that you may have for supercomputing centers. There are supercomputing centers around the country at many universities, and certainly many universities that have what's called the MATLAB Distributed Computing Server that allows MATLAB to run in these, par make parallel pools on clusters that are not your own local machine. And so I have just a partial list of um, uh, universities in the Americas, a few in Europe, and then these supercomputing centers where you may have access to this parallel computing um, uh, software without you being aware of it yet. So definitely check with your system administrator. Uh, so here's a quick example. We were doing um, a parameter sweep solving a system of ordinary differential equations. And um, in the ideal, if, as we add workers, we should get our um, speed up being proportional to the number of workers. And in this case, you can see we didn't get it linearly speeding up, but it became pretty close to the ideal here. So our speed up went from. Um, for, from 1 to 1 to 12 to 11.2, so that's pretty good. The next thing I want to talk about is GPUs, or graphical programming units. Um, these are quite popular these days for offloading some of the calculations from your, the main part of your um, computer. And I want to show you, um, similarly as I did to the um, par 4 loop, how uh, easy this can be to do. So if I'm going to do some calculation here, the way I would do it in parallel with GPUs is I'm going to create my array, I'm going to convert my array into a GPU array. Basically, that's going to send the data to the GPU. I'm going to create my, my right-hand side, in this case, uh, on the GPU with random numbers. I'm going to let the GPU now do this FFT because it's a GPU array. I'm going to let the GPU do this. And when I'm all done doing all my calculations, the only other thing I have to do is um, bring the information back from the GPU. So again, the guts of your calculation don't need to change. It's the setup for the variables and the bringing the data back. And the, the, rest, um, the rest just works um, with it. Uh, works because we've overloaded many, many functions there. And you can look on our website to find out more about what there is if you need to. Um, that is part of the parallel computing toolbox, both PAR4 and um, uh, the GPU computing. And here's another benchmark we were solving, in this case, the 2D wave equation. And you can see here that the simulation times for the CPU go up uh, a bit, and the uh, GPUs go up much more slowly in this case, except for very small grid sizes. But as soon as you get away from too small a grid size, maybe size 200 or so, the GPU is uh, superior in performance to doing the same calculation for the 2D wave equation um, uh, here than the CPU. I want to now uh, go quickly through what's new in MATLAB, just so you're aware. And uh, here's the release highlights from our 2014B. I've actually been showing you as we go along much of the new graphics system. The one other thing I wanted to point out is that here I've got a figure that has two different um, subplots in it with color maps. You may now have different color maps based on the subplot in MATLAB, and that should make certain visualization things much easier for you. I showed you the date and time data types. Um, I mentioned uh, new functionality for big data. In fact, I use data store, but we have more. Um, what I haven't showed you are the following three. There's um, a tremendous support for low-cost hardware, depending on what you're doing. We may already have drivers for what you need uh, to work with your hardware with MATLAB. Um, we also have the ability to take work that you've done and uh, bundle it into a toolbox so that you can package it and hand it to your colleagues for use, and this can be very useful. And uh, we also have integrated MATLAB in with Git and Subversion so that you can do source code control and sharing of projects with other people. Um, got a bunch of links here uh, related, uh, on related topics. There's both videos, code, and in some cases webinars on all these topics. What's new in MATLAB, parallel computing, mapping toolbox, signal processing toolbox. 
And now for community resources, um, which I think is really important also. Um, we have a community, a MATLAB community on our website. And um, rather than stay in the slides here, I'm going to come over to my um, uh, browser here and show you the um, community website. What you see here is MATLAB Central. It's basically um, a collection of different um, uh, capabilities here. So we have a file exchange. People upload their files when they want to share them with other people, and it allows you to download files there. MATLAB Answers, where you can ask questions and people from the community will answer when they can. Um, blogs by insiders, like me and several of my other colleagues here, and so on. Um, the nice thing is, if you're on the file exchange or on MATLAB Answers, suppose you want to know, um, has anyone asked any questions about earthquakes? Because I have some questions about earthquakes. Why don't I first see what's there? Well, here I've searched MATLAB Answers for, for earthquake, and you see that there's been some questions over time here. And I could also search for NASA and USGS and all sorts of things like that. If you don't find what you want on MATLAB Central, another good source of um, searching is Google. If you look for MATLAB and map, you'll find fairly early on mapping toolbox, mapping examples, um, and all kinds of other information there. Um, we found a lot of great user toolboxes when we go looking for things here. Um, and in particular, I want to show you um, uh, two things that are, I think, near and dear to your community. The first is um, we've got a web page here for Gizmo. Um, Gizmo is a suite of tools that I'm told that many, many people from the Irish community use quite a bit. And, um, uh, you know, it's a great suite of tools that you, that you can use with MATLAB, and uh, hopefully you know about them. And um, Iris, as I alluded to earlier, has the ability to be able to load um, data uh, from particular repositories over the network. And so they've got things set up in a framework so that you can um, be independent of sort of where you're grabbing the data from. And uh, finally, um, there is um, a great new page that we've helped put together. My colleague Lisa Kempler uh, put together this for uh, CERC if you're teaching undergraduates. Um, this is a MATLAB page for all kinds of information about what you might be able to get, including, including um, links to uh, other course curricula, other books, um, things like that, anything that might help you um, with, uh, with your teaching. So I'm going to just go through the last slide there. I think that um, I just want to quickly summarize. Um, I believe MATLAB has tremendous support for your work in seismology, and I've gone through some of this. We have the ability to import the data that you need. We've got the mathematics that is basically the math of uh, technical computing and, and seismology and geophysics. A lot of visualization. The mapping, including the interactive mapping, is, is really useful. Um, taking advantage of the hardware that you've got available and accessible parallel and GPU computing, and then the broad MathWorks community uh, uh, resources and the seismology community resources that are there for you. And I think with that, um, I think, uh, Danielle, we are ready to think about um, taking some questions. Great, thanks. Um, so one of the first questions we kind of uh, talked about ourselves, Lauren, about um, just the availability of these codes. Um, so, uh, would you mind telling the group just um, what you like? How we'll make this available? Okay. Um, what I um, I I am just looking for something right here. Sure. <laughs> uh, what I'm looking for is um, trying to change my s setup. Um, yeah. No worries. No, um, no I, I'm just trying to put this on this on. S yeah. Um, so I see another question about the slides themselves. So we plan to put the uh, webinar itself, um, everything that you've seen and heard today, um, on our YouTube channel, our IRS Education and Public Outreach YouTube channel. And we will be sending a um, email through our IRS bulk uh, mail listserv to uh, let everyone know about um, when the webinar has been posted up on YouTube. So we should have that cranked out and ready by the end of the week, as well as Lauren and I have discussed um, how uh, to yes, get we, these scripts available online. Um, and there's- can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can't hear you, Lauren. Okay, <laughs> yeah, because I, I changed my, my uh, speaker system oh. just now. Uh, okay, so um, we're gonna place the code that I used here 
up on MATLAB Central on the file exchange, and um, we will let you know, Danielle, when that's ready. And um, then you can we can send a link out to everyone so that they can download the um, the code that I used. Great, wonderful. Um, so Christelle, um, sorry if I butcher your last name, Wathier. Um, she wanted to ask if there was an easy way to change the new default color map, the Perula that you showed, to the previous version ones. Um, there is a pretty, there's a way, I, I don't know how easy, easy it is, but basically um, you, um, I, I actually, I, I'd like to talk about why you'd want to do that at some point in actuality, but uh, reproducing other results might be a reason to want to switch back to the other one. And uh, there is a way, what you'd do is you'd probably create a couple lines of code in your startup.m. Let me just, um, um, let me do, bring up the documentation here. And I think, let me look for default. Um, default, and I'm going to look only in MATLAB. Default is a big name. A big, so the idea here, what I'm trying to do is win down. Um, so there's um, some information in graphics here. OK, so there's a bunch of information about graphics and um, uh, defaults and um, this I'm not coming up real fast with exactly what I want but basically um, if if we have trouble finding it I'll find the the right link and we'll put it in the email to send out to everyone about how to change the uh, the default color map but but basically you put basically two lines of code in your startup.m and then it will use that instead of Perula going forward okay great thanks um Sing-Ho Young uh, asks, it looks like MATLAB, uh, the version uh, 2013A, um, has the PAR4 and GPU array. And so uh, when you mentioned that there are new features added to the uh, 2014B, um, what does that mean for what's available in the 2013A version? Uh, without reading the release notes right now, I wouldn't know exactly... There are a bunch. We add them every single release. So, can you hear me? This is Hazel. Um, every release, uh, pretty much, we add new supported functions, meaning that, say, a toolbox, like image processing toolbox, has new functions that are supported by GPU. So, even though we did have, as you said, GPU support and uh, PowerPoint support, the specific toolboxes you're using or the specific functions you're making use of may or may not have had that support yet. And so each with each release you get more. Okay. So with each release there's just more support? Is that yes. Okay. Um, uh Min Ding asks, Lauren, could you give some comments on the MATLAB numerical simulation? Um uh I guess I don't know what that means exactly. Could 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 he clarify that question a little bit? Um, yeah, so if you write in again, we can come back to it. Um, but for the time being, I'll continue on. Um, Jean Massian asks, um, I've had some performance issues with visualizing large data sets in MATLAB figure windows. For example, a surface plot of a 50 megabyte bathymetric data set is really slow to pan or zoom or rotate in a figure window. Are there tools or techniques to speed up visualization of large surfaces? So um, there's a couple parts to this answer, I think. First of all, I don't know whether um, this user is using R2014B. Um, quite a bit of infrastructure changed between before from before 14B to this current release. And many of the... Um, uh, operations that you could do have been sped up. We do know that there were some performance issues and we have been putting out patches for the ones we knew about. I know there's one in the Mac for the Mac that we patched. And the um, third thing I want to say is on the um, blogs uh, part of our MATLAB Central, there's a blog that is specifically about graphics and I would encourage you, I don't know for sure that anyone's asked this particularly, but I would encourage you to um, post a question there and ask Mike. He is a wizard, and he will be able to help you. 
Um, in general, Lauren, this is my own question, would be, it seems like there's a lot of people at MathWorks that are ready and able to help. So what would just your general, for additional questions in the future, if you're having an issue, um, you know, what is the general consensus at MathWorks that you guys are ready and willing to answer any questions or? Yeah, I think that the, probably the fastest turnaround you get is if you go to, again, that MATLAB community page, the MATLAB Central, there's a section there called MATLAB Answers. And let me come back here, uh, here, MATLAB Answers. Um, and the for, good practice is to first search and see if someone's answered your question already. And if not, post it. And, you know, a lot of people at MathWorks read it, and a lot of MATLAB devotees who are not part of MathWorks uh, respond there, too. If that doesn't get what you what you need, um, you can always contact technical support. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, Lisa Kahn mentions, on an early slide, there was a list of outside data formats that MATLAB can handle, like the NOAA or IRIS files. Um, she wondered if the 2013 version also can do this or if this is something new with this particular release. Each file format might be different, so I don't know about the outside ones because they're not ones that we necessarily maintain. I know OpenDAP has worked for a long time. Uh, Iris Fetch, I'm pretty sure, yes. has worked for a long yeah. time. <laughs> Some of the other ones I'm less clear on. Okay. WebRead is new. So, so reading from the web that I did in that demo, that's new. So even though I read it from USGS, there were other ways you could have read that data before, but not the way I did it there. But the best thing you can do is uh, do a search on um, on any on whatever it is you're looking for in Google. So MATLAB and the and name of the file type or MATLAB data formats is another way you can search, and the latest and greatest information will come up. Now, if you're using a previous release, though, um, either your documentation that you have with your product or or the documentation for your release is behind the login, so you'd have to use your um, your account to get into that earlier version of the documentation. But that would still be you know accurate information as of that release, um, that you know behind the login. Okay. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Nasser Najibi asks, Lauren, is it possible to link MATLAB to other geo software such as ArcGIS? And if so, um, how could um, he get some good help and tutorial about that? Would you know anything about that? So that's an example where we support many of their data data types, that file types. And shape and files so in that case. I assume you mean uh, that by linking that you know ability to read the same the data that that you know they work with. Um, I don't know if you're thinking something else in terms of an interface. Um, there are many, one thing Lauren didn't have a chance to talk about is many of the interfaces we have, like the ability to call external programs. You can call C or Java or .NET, et cetera. Um, so often if there's something you're trying to call from that lab, um, you can do that. If the, if the other software has a, an interface that they publish, that, and it, usually if they do, then it's available, as Lisa said, in either C, Java, or .NET. And if that's true, then, um, you could easily, relatively easily, make a connection yourself and read it in. If, if the files aren't if, sufficient. If the files aren't sufficient. Great, thanks. Um, so Minding, we're back with uh, kind of an updated question um, about the numerical simulation. So, um, for example, is there any toolbox for finite difference uh, element method or discrete element method, etc.? And then, in quotes, said, uh, actually, I feel like most people um, in numerical simulation do not use MATLAB, but is not sure. So do you know anything about, like, toolboxes for finite difference? Well, we have a, a PDE toolbox that um, basically will let you um, mesh a 2D domain and, um, and do, you know, 2D finite elements on it. Um, we don't have more capability just yet. Um, I have seen people roll their own, um, and we do have things that can help you. For example, the Delaunay triangulation and, and um, scattered interpolants. They they will allow you to build up uh, tetrahedron or whatever you need in the different dimensions, and then do what you want. But there's nothing that does it all for you right now. Okay, great. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so that's the end of our questions. Um, so I just want to take a moment to thank everyone, especially Lauren, for giving such a great webinar um, and instructing our community um, about everything that's going on with MATLAB. Um, so thank you all for attending 
our webinar and uh, let me know if there's any way that um, we can facilitate anything in the future and if there's any questions that we on the IRA side can help you with. So thanks so much. Lauren, do you have anything else to say? No, just thank you for spending your afternoon with me. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.